11 o'clock in there. <laughs> Hi, I'm librarian Paul Sevilla with the Livermore Public Library. Welcome to our author talk today. Our guest today is Mike Wirtz, head of the University of the Pacific Holt Atherton Special Collections and Archives. He oversees the use and preservation of the historical archives of nearly 500 collections, such as the John Muir papers, the George Moscone collection, and Japanese American internment during World War II collections. He holds a master's degree in history and library science. And today he's going to present about his book, John Mears, Grand Yosemite, Music and Sketches. Look at that, it's even got the, the LPC UPC. Yeah, <laughs> so it's available to check out from your local library. There we Welcome, go. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Thank, thank you for Paul. giving this presentation about John Muir's stories and sketches. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Paul, and thanks to the uh, the um, Livermore Public Library as well. Um, been looking forward to this talk for quite a while. So, okay, you want to go ahead and get started? Yes, and okay. I encourage the community members to type their chat, uh, type their questions in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that in the background. Yeah, and I'll I'll be peeking at it too. So if you have any comments or questions, don't hesitate to throw them in there. Also, uh, I wanted to kind of start off before we get started to give you an idea of how big are these drawings of John Muir's. This is one of the ones that we're going to look at in a little bit, and it's small. This is uh, probably about an average size John Muir drawing. It's pretty small, and you're probably going, Mike, you're an archivist. How come you're not using gloves? Well, I do this because I need the tact in my fingers, but more importantly, my hands are very, very clean. It's when you're handling photographs that you definitely want to have those gloves. So this is one of the images that we're going to look at today. I'll set this over here. And here's another one. One more to show. This one's really small. This is a John Muir's cabin in Yosemite. So we'll we'll take a good look at that a little bit later. So without further ado, let's get into this thing. I'm going to share my screen. Paul, you remind me if I didn't get, if I accidentally have the um the uh if I accidentally have my browser in there too. So all right. All right, so yeah, um, again, welcome everyone. I'm really excited about giving this talk today to you. Um, and it should be pretty interesting. Basically what you can expect is, you know, we're gonna journey through John Muir's Yosemite about 150 years ago. And you're going to see a lot of drawings of John Muir's, of course. And you're gonna see some musings. I'm gonna read you some passages from some of his works. And then lastly, you'll hear some stories about Muir, Yosemite, and a little bit about um, my, my uh, my project of finding some of these places where John Muir sat to make these drawings throughout his life. And again, I will be monitoring the chat. So, and I'll be asking questions every now and then, and you can put your answers into the chat, or um, if you just want to ask me a, a, a any old question that you want. Uh, Mr. Pants decided to join us today. I'm really excited about that. Okay, so uh, yeah, here we go. Let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about this guy here. You're probably, many of you are probably quite familiar with him. I'm going to kind of give you a rundown. Um, you know, he's really most famous for preserving natural spaces and calling others to preserve natural spaces as well. And how did he do that? By observing these places and spaces, by taking notes, making drawings, and then sharing those ideas of his with the world through articles and books. So let's get a little idea of who he was here. You know, you can kind of see he's got a lot of uh, a lot of things to his dossier there, but really, you know, you can see it's all really important to kind of give it, give us a little bit of context of who he was and when he lived. Um, he's born in the little town of Dunbar, Scotland, not too far from Edinburgh, and he was there for about ten years, and then his family picked up and moved to Wisconsin, in in the United States, and. Uh, a little bit later, he goes to University of Wisconsin just for a couple of years and then eventually makes it into Canada. And you can see throughout this time, he's already making drawings, which is critical to what we're talking about today is his drawings. Clear on the left side, there's a drawing from his childhood inside, inside one of his books. It's a grammar book of his where he made pictures of peacocks and dogs and things like that. The middle one is actually a drawing of his home in uh, Wisconsin. This drawing is really large. It's probably about 
of 11 by 17. It's really a big drawing. The one underneath it is uh, Muir was quite the inventor at this time in his life when he was in Wisconsin. And this was a loafer's chair. And the way the loafer's chair would work is that if somebody were to relax in that chair too much, it would cause a rifle near the chair to go off and wake you up. So this is pretty much what he was doing with his inventions. He did good inventions too. And then uh, the next drawing is actually from his uh, time when he was in, uh, in uh, Canada, working at a maple uh, farm where he's working there and doing that. When he's about 28 years old, he moves to Indianapolis, Indiana. And he, uh, he's working in a carriage factory really late one night. And he's working with a file. And some of you probably remember that sometimes a file has like a handle to it and you can take the file out and put another file in. Well, if you take that file out, it's got this really sharp edge on the, other, the file that goes into the handle. And so Mira was working late one evening and he was trying to loosen some, some, uh, uh, some ties and he was using this sharp point of the file. And what happened is he kind of lost grip and the file flew around and went bam, right up into his right eye. And when it dropped, went into his eye, he dropped the file and then he opened up his eye and the aqueous humor of his eye was dripping into his hand. And this is a pretty big moment in John Muir's life. He kind of thinks about what he's been doing with his life and he, you know, covers his eye. He walks back to where he's living. His left eye goes sympathetically blind and he's in blindness for about three weeks. Couldn't see anything. The doctors weren't really sure that he was going to be able to get his sight back. But in that darkness, and there's a, a letter that he wrote to his friend um, showing where he pierced his, his right eye. But in that darkness, he got to thinking about his life and what he can do. And that at the bottom, there is a passage from his unpublished autobiography, which is available online through our website. And he writes, I bade adieu to all mechanical inventions, determined to devote the rest of my life to studying the inventions of God. So this is John Muir. He's like, I am no longer going to be working in these factories and this hustle and bustle. I want to be out in nature. A big turning point in John Muir's life. So he immediately decides that he's going to go on a thousand mile walk to the Gulf. He actually goes home for a little bit, but then he sets off on the famous thousand mile walk. And this is through the South during the Civil War, right after the Civil War. And he makes all sorts of drawings. That big one right there at the top, that's him spreading out a map right before he sets off in Louisville, Kentucky. You can see he makes a drawing of somebody getting eaten by an alligator. He didn't witness this, but he, he has a, an epiphany at this moment about the value of animals, even if they're so-called bad animals or mean, ferocious animals, he kind of understands that a lot better. He makes observations about African-Americans. Some of those observations we would consider derogatory today, but really it's a context of the time. He's seeing African-Americans right after 200 years of enslavement or more. And so he, he looks at them with, with this different eye with that. But he makes all these wonderful drawings, and there are many more in this. And if you want to look at these, these are available online to look at. So after he gets, uh, he gets to Savannah, and he, you know, he sleeps in a cemetery one night, probably ended up getting malaria, but he ended up having malaria on that West Coast stop of Florida. And he recovered from malaria, and then he decided his original intent was actually to go to South America. He wanted to follow in the famous footsteps of Alexander von Humboldt, but he decided not to go to South America to look at the plants. And he said, well, I think I'm going to go to California. But first, he went to Cuba for a little bit. Then he had to go to New York to get a boat that would take him to Panama. He crosses the Isthmus of Panama, sails up the west coast of North America, and lands in the streets of San Francisco. And this is where he says, what's the nearest way out of town? Where can I get to the uncultivated wild parts of the state? And somebody said, where do you wish to go? And he says, anywhere that is wild. And so he makes his way across the Central Valley of California, going to the most stupendous, the most beautiful place that you can possibly manage and imagine on the face of the earth. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, hold on a second. Wait, wrong slide. Um, he sees Yosemite for the first time. So he's 30 years old and he steps foot in Yosemite in 1868. And this is where my story begins in the book. So now we've kind of gotten an idea of who Muir is and where he's coming from. So where, do, where does this fit in? Where, what am I, you know, where does this all fit into this? Uh, somebody wants to know the website. Um, I'm not sure yet. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, when I, when I, travel, one of the things I like to do is to go to places where things have happened. I'd like to reenact and visit 
places where things have happened, where you can feel a thrill or a loss or where things happen. And I think about this in the idea of sense of place or power of place and how when you're in some place where something has happened, it you really kind of begin to feel like you're there at that time. And, um, you know, obviously I've been there to the steps where uh, Martin Luther King stood at the Lincoln Memorial. In fact, there's even etched in the, in the steps right there. You can stand exactly where he did in 1963. And I started to do this with some of John Muir's drawings as well. And that's me standing on Mount Rubidoux, not near Riverside, California. Um, it's kind of interesting, you know, because I having this feeling of, you know, uh, of this power of place and sense of place, because I'm really not that kind of person. Um, but anyway, so I started to do this. And uh, I, I said, well, you know, there are pictures of John Muir in Yosemite. And sure enough, here's a picture of John Muir at the base of Vernal Fall. And you can tell that I'm in the right place. And don't forget, Stephen, we will stop by this on our trip. Um, you can tell that I'm in the right place because we had that very distinctive Y crack in the rock. Now, this is kind of an interesting photograph for a number of reasons, not only because I found the exact place where Muir was sitting, that rock that he's sitting on, but he's visiting with Henry Fairfield Osborne and Henry Fairfield Osborne's wife and his two daughters. And what makes this story a little bit interesting is Osborne was not only a paleontologist, a geologist, president of the American Museum of Natural History, he was also a supporter of eugenics. In fact, he wrote a book about eugenics in 1916. What are eugenics? Eugenics is this idea that we can kind of encourage the propagation of what was considered good genes and discourage the prop propagation of bad genes. And uh, so he was very much involved with this. Did Muir ever have a conversation with uh, Osborne about eugenics? I don't know, um, but uh, you know, and there's no indication in any of his letters about it either. But this is an interesting photograph because it gives us a lens into much a larger story. But I got to thinking, you know, not only did Muir is in these photographs, and that would be fun to be in these photographs, but he also um, made a lot of drawings. And I got to thinking about, you know, how could we make these drawings? They're all over. We've got sketches, and these are available online, by the way. Drawings in his journals, in his letters, in articles, in his books are tons and tons of drawings that John Muir made of Yosemite and other places around the world, all over the world. And I was been, you know, my uh, my supervisor clear back in 2005 and I thought a lot about how, you know, how do we share these? You know, should we do a coffee table book or something? And finally, I had the opportunity. I worked with the Yosemite Conservancy quite a bit on other projects and I lobbied this idea at them and they said, sure, let's take a look at it. So I'm really thankful for that to kind of look at Yosemite through Mira's eyes. And so I created this book and on each spread, you get a mirror drawing, so that's kind of cool. Uh, you get uh, longitude and latitude, exactly the point where Mirror was probably sitting. I'll tell you more about that in a second. And some directions on how to get to that point. You'll get a cool uh, passage of John Muir when he's talking about something. And then lastly, uh, there's, you know, there's commentary about that particular spot. Maybe some news or information that I found about that spot. And there are 25 sites throughout Yosemite in this book. Now, you're going to get a special treat. Although I'm not going to talk about all 25 and 25 of the sites in this uh, presentation today, I am going to talk about a few sites that are not in the book. So you get a special treat by coming today. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, sometimes the sites aren't exactly where Muir sat when he made the drawing. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is it's not exactly John Muir's Yosemite anymore. It's, um, you know, some of the sites are downright dangerous. Where Muir went, he was very careful. And as you can see, I'm not being careful. This is not one of Muir's sites, by the way, but I'm about 1,200 feet above the Merced River right there at the top of uh, Nevada Falls, and I'm doing a selfie. Now, is that the stupidest moment in my life? Yeah, yeah, it was the stupidest moment of my life right there on the edge of that cliff. So that's something you shouldn't do. And so it's not that safe. So we need to make sure that people aren't going to unsafe places in this book. Additionally, in fact, I'll put this into the chat. Does anybody recognize who that person is standing in the meadow there? And the problem with this is that he's standing in the meadow. Although Yosemite has these grand granite walls everywhere, you know, the, the meadows are very fragile. 
And some of the sites that Muir made his drawings from are in places that are really fragile. So we try to choose places that are easier, not so dangerous and not so hard on the environment. For those of you that don't know that gentleman standing in the meadow there, that's our famed Huell Hauser of, of uh, PBS fame and his on the California, what was the name of it? California's gold when he visited Yosemite, but he's standing right there in the meadow. So something we don't want to have happen. All right, so let's get started. I've kind of taken you up to in Muir's life up to when he's about 20, almost 30 years old, 30 years old. But I see throughout Muir's life is that there are three very distinct parts of his life. Early on, it's about revelry. He's looking at everything and he's just very excited to see it and bask in it. Then he really focuses on the science and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then lastly, preservation. What does he do for preservation? And these are the three very important things. So we're gonna look at these slide, these images kind of using that same idea of re uh, revelry, science and preservation. So let's talk about revelry first. This is probably one of the most remarkable drawings that John Muir made. And you can quickly tell what it's of, it's of half dome. You can also see Washington column, North dome and Royal arches. And while you're guessing where, you can put into the chat, where do you think John Muir is sitting when he makes this drawing? I'm gonna read you a quote of John Muir's. Once arrived in the valley, it's important to know to, what to do with oneself. I would advise sitting from morning till night under some willow bush or on a riverbank where there's a wide view. This will be doing the valley far more effectively than riding along trails in constant motion from point to point. Now, this is kind of an interesting idea. You know, uh, this happens to me a lot when I'm in Yosemite and people say, I'm only here for a couple hours. I'm only here for a day. What should I do? Where should I, what hikes could I do? And sometimes I just tell them, look, if you have that much time, just go sit by a river someplace and just look up and be inspired, you know, enjoy the awe of Yosemite. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit more time to figure out where this was drawn from because I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about it. But when I found this, I'm like, oh, this is easy. I, all I have to do is, you know, there's a river in the foreground and I just need to line up some of the mountains in the background. There's my river, the Merced River. There's Half Dome, there's uh, Washington Column. This one's gonna be a piece of cake, but nothing seemed to line up. I'm like, why isn't this? So I went back to my office, broke open my best technology and got into Google Earth with VR. This is an amazing tool. If you've ever had the opportunity, it is so much fun. I don't know if the Livermore Public Library has access to this technology, but it is amazing. You can literally, well, I guess virtually, fly anywhere you want in the world. And so what I could do is I could actually go into space flying around and I could line up the things that I needed to line up in the, in the drawing and then just back up till I hit the ground. And sure enough, when I back up, I hit the ground and it's right there. And uh, I, you know, you can see I can kind of line this up a little bit. This is the Google view, the virtual view when it's I land on the ground and I could line things up and say, yeah, this is the right place. And once I kind of figure out where it is on Google, I make a note of it and I go out to the field and I find the spot and I look at it and I say, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, notice I'm standing in the field. That's a bad thing to do, don't do that. But anyway, I'm standing in the field there. But this is actually a really fun part of my project is that once I'm out there, I meet people and they tell me stories about how it's their first time in Yosemite. And they too kind of get excited about seeing where John Muir stood when he made these drawings all those years ago. And, the thing, and then of course I capture the longitude and latitude of that place. And it turns out we're actually at Cook's Meadow, which is at the base of Yosemite Falls almost, rather than right up and close, like I was trying to do. And the thing that really is funny, and you could probably, if you've been to Yosemite, since you've had your phone and you still have pictures of Yosemite in your phone, you likely have this exact spot in your phone already. In fact, when I went back and did my research, sure enough, that bottom picture, I was standing in this spot in the snow in 2017. And then it turned out my brother-in-law had taken the exact same image in 2018. This is before I'd even done the project. So it's a very common spot. It's right there on Cook's Meadow. So that what we see in the foreground is not a river. It's actually, a, um, it's actually the, the, the meadow in the foreground there. Okay, does anybody wanna try and guess where this one's drawn from? I'll read you a little quote while you're thinking about that. You got some markers there. 
From Yosemite Creek, near where it first gathered its beaten waters at the foot in the, at the fall, I dug a small ditch and brought the stream of water into the cabin, entering at one end and out the other with just enough current to allow it to sing and warble in low, sweet tones. So here, Muir builds a house on top of a creek so he could listen to how beautiful it is at night. And we've got some pretty easy markers there. There's a waterfall and there's some trees and you can see some cliffs and it's like, and he says cabin in Yo Valley. So we've got some idea, but fortunately for us, we also have a plaque sitting on a rock right there at the base of Yosem Lower Yosemite Falls. Well, I started to look at this and, and I thought something just doesn't look right here. And, you know, I, I kept looking at this, trying to figure it out. I went to the rock itself and sure enough, you can see the drawing has been etched into the rock, into the, into the uh, plaque there, into the rock. And there's my friend, a library colleague of mine, sitting exactly as, uh, I can't remember this woman's name, oh, Rose Beale did in 1926. This plaque has not moved, but it really got me thinking a lot about where is this site, because things just weren't lining up. So I did a bunch more research. I got many more stories about that, I'll save you. But the idea is I finally realized that more likely than not, that site is, um, that site is right there on the edge of, uh, uh, there's actually a little baseball park right at the base of Yosemite Falls, right near the bottom of Yosemite Fall. And sure enough, I'm pretty sure that John Muir's cabin was on the edge of that little meadow there. The trees are different, of course, you know, 150 years, a lot has happened in that time. Yes, uh, it does make you want to kind of get back to Yosemite and take a look at this again, because you know, and now they have a lot of different ways of getting uh, into Yosemite, so. All right, this is a great one here. Uh, this is from his notebook from his, he actually experienced this in 1869, but he wrote it down in this notebook in the 1880s, and then finally published it in 1911 in my first summer in the Sierra. And what Muir really wanted to do is he wanted to get a good view of what it was like to be a waterfall. And he wrote, I should be able to learn far, uh, lean far enough out to see the forms and behavior of the fall all the way down to the bottom. This is a really big bottom. <laughs> it's, it's about the, the uh, entire Yosemite fall from top to bottom is 2,500 feet. And the upper fall alone is 1,500 feet. So this is a little zoom in on that. You can see that little tiny person, that's John Muir. And this is what he writes. While perched on that narrow niche, I was not distinctly conscious of danger. The tremendous grandeur of the fall in form and sound and motion, acting at close range, smothered the sense of fear. How long I remained down there or how I returned, I can hardly tell. Anyhow, I had a glorious time and got back to camp about dark, enjoying the triumphant exhilaration, soon followed by a dull weariness. Thereafter, I'll try to keep from such extravagant nerve straining places. Now you can see that this drawing is probably not from the ground. He's probably out in space. And it was interestingly enough that uh, the Yosemite Conservancy just published this image of the entire falls on their website, on uh, Facebook yesterday. And I'm like, this is a wonderful picture showing everything that's going on. And probably a really good one to kind of show you where Muir was likely standing when he made that, or when he imagined that drawing. And for those of you that kind of remember what we already just talked about where Muir's cabin was, you can see this little tiny way down in the lower left hand, you can see a little meadow down there and that's where Muir's, um, where, Muir's uh, uh, where that cabin was. We might come back to this again. But my favorite part of this story of Muir's is that uh, that night he went to bed and he kept waking up. He says, all night I dreamed of falling into the valley. And one time, springing to my feet, I said, this time is real. All must die. And where could a mountaineer find a more glorious death? And it got me thinking about life and death. And I don't want to get weird and morbid here, but I do think about that. You know, if, if something were to happen to me, um, you know, if something were to happen to me, uh, you know, where would I want that to happen? Would I want it to happen in Yosemite on the precipice of a 1500 foot cliff? Or would I want that driving down Interstate 580 to get to the, to the, you know, to get down to Whole Foods or something like that. It makes me think a lot about how these things happen. All right, here's a good one. This is from one of his uh, journals. And uh, I dare anybody to kind of guess what this is of, as well as where is it drawn from. And I'd looked at this one for a long time. 
And finally, uh, I kind of figured it out because if you look really carefully, you can see half dome right there. We'll talk about this in a minute. And Muir wrote, had to say, he wrote, when I'd reached an elevation above Sunnyside, the tip of the mountains of the Merced Group, which is now called the Clark Range, began to rise above the curve between South Dome, which was now Half Dome, and Mount Star King. These are adorned as I had never seen them before. From the thin wave-like summit of Mount Clark, the sharp pyramid like gray point of Gray Mountain, there streamed a splendid white banner of splendid dimensions seen against the blue sky. The effect was indescribably grand. So what he's seeing, he ends up calling snow banners. And uh, there's a little evolution going on here. That's more or less the view that Muir probably saw. He, I think he's on the trail going up on uh, lower Yosemite Falls or Yosemite Falls. And you can kind of see things line up with the drawing, but you can see he came back to the studio and in the lower left there, that's kind of like a watercolor that he did in 1873. I'm sorry, the original drawing is 1873. Then he does these two in the studio, they're kind of in the middle. Then finally he publishes this story about snow banners in his book uh, called Snow Banners of the California Alps in 1877. And somebody else made that drawing for him that actually ended up in the book. In, his, in that drawing or in that article. Uh, this is a really interesting one. This one is one that I'm still trying to fight with right now. Uh, one of my friends, Mr. Pants, has actually ha helped me try to find this one. We're not quite there. I mean, it says right there, it's from Cathedral Peak. Where is he standing when he gets to Cathedral Peak? But he has this great quote. Uh, and as you can see, he says, above a lofty, lofty glacial polished wall. And he writes, when he's at the top of Cathedral Peak, he writes, I reached the topmost spire of the grand old church about noon of the first day and sat down to rest and eat. And now here is the strange thing. I was seated on the brink of a precipice about 7,000 feet in depth. And in eating, whenever I looked up, I was hungry. Whenever I looked down, I was full. So this one, I wanted to experience that. I've actually been to the top of Cathedral Peak a million years ago. Um, this one, Google VR was very helpful, but it hasn't completely rendered the top of Cathedral Peak. So I couldn't quite line this one up. But the big clue there is when Mir talks about above a glacial polished wall. Now for the book, I actually send people to a very accessible uh, pothole dome where I'm standing in that middle picture there. And Pothole Dome, you can see way in the distance, you can see um, uh, Cathedral Peak. And that's, that's peak furthest on the left of that picture in the middle. But on the right or in the, above my head, that is the top of that lofty glacial polished wall. And that is Fairview Dome. And in the lower picture, that's me at the base of that lofty glacial polished wall. When I went there a couple of years ago with a friend of mine, my next, uh, next year I do plan to get to the top of that and uh, see if I can see that from its exact same place. Okay, this one's kind of fun. I like to tell this one. Uh, some of you might be familiar with John Muir's most famous story. It's, it's called uh, uh, Stikine about a dog in a glacier or something like that. You can find it online. Just search dog glacier Muir. It's a short story of his, it's about uh, 20 pages long. And it's this wonderful story about him going off onto a glacier and a dog insisting on following him onto the glacier. And Mir is trying to implore him, don't come with me, don't come with me. But the dog insisted on coming along. And so Mir writes, so at last I told him to come on if he must. And I gave him a piece of bread I had in my pocket. Then we struggled on together and thus began the most memorable of all my wild days. And the story of this particular site is probably the most memorable of all my wild days in Yosemite. This was just an amazing day in Yosemite. So it all started, <laughs> it all started, um, my friend Bob Hare. Now, I'm going to do a call out to Bob Hare. I don't think he's with us today. No, that's too bad. Bob Hare has done more research than I have on these sites. And um, he too wants to write a book about it. And he's done a ton of really fascinating uh, spots of mirrors way out in the back country that I have not yet seen. I'm kind of a front country guy and Bob's been way deep into the back country. And um, so he and I, he and I they were, were there for an entire week, a couple of summers ago. And first thing we had to do is we had to ride our bikes up this uh, road up to a, uh, up to a, a water tank that is 
it's, it's not that you're not allowed to go to it, but they discourage people from going to this water tank. And so we had to ditch our, our bikes in the bushes there. And then we had to go up this really steep thing. It really wasn't a trail. We just kind of went up the side of this hill because we kind of had an idea of where Muir had made these drawings from, from VR. And so we went up this hill, went up this hill, and finally we sat down to take a break. And you can see Bob sitting on a little rock there. But in front of Bob is this amazing rock. It's like, wow, this looks like a really nice rock. So we sit down and we're chomping away and we're eating whatever our food, cheese and hard boiled eggs or something like that. And I'm sitting there and I'm just kind of going, trying to look around. I've got the drawing in my hand. I'm just trying to think about it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there it is. And you can see it's a little bit harder to see today because a lot of trees have grown in the meantime, but there it is. That's a North Dome at the top there. And you can see, um, this is a, a Washington column in the foreground and way in the other background. I can't remember the name of this dome. I don't think it has a name, but it's also right there. And you can see Muir includes all those. In fact, Muir even includes um, uh, uh, royal arches in his dra drawing, but you can't see it anymore because the uh, trees are in the way. But that was just an amazing day to sit right there. And it turns out Muir made... Uh, was it three or four different drawings from right around this area? So that was just a glorious day of just being in Yosemite and kind of having these amazing moments with John Muir. And of course, we celebrated once we finally found that spot. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier part of Muir's life being about revelry and just looking at things and being amazed by everything. But really, once Muir got to Yosemite, you know, he obviously had that revelry, but this is when the science side of Muir really starts to kick in. He really wants to understand what he's seeing now. He wants to figure out the environment. He wants to figure out how things fit and how they work together. And so uh, this is one of his drawings and you can see it's of Sentinel Rock. And interestingly enough, in 1872, John Muir experienced an earthquake. And he writes this, the shocks were so violent and varied and it succeeded one another so closely that I had to balance myself carefully in walking as if on the deck of a ship among waves. And it seemed impossible that the high cliffs of the valley could escape being shattered. In particular, I feared that the sheer fronted, uh, sheer fronted sentinel rock towering above my cabin would be shaken down. This is my favorite part. And I took shelter back of a large yellow pine, hoping that it might protect me from at least the smaller outbounding boulders. And he later writes, it's as if nature were wrecking her Yosemite temple and getting ready to build still a better one. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, you know, uh, uh, this is Mir kind of thinking about science. Uh, coincidentally enough, this 1872 earthquake just had its 150th anniversary, like earlier this week. So you've had a couple of really good coincidental 150th anniversaries this week. But this is now getting into science. And this one is not too far from where that other one was made of half dome. We're gonna come back to that in the middle, in a minute, but this, this one's pretty darn close to where Muir is uh, when he did that. Okay, uh, now we are looking down valley. And if anybody wants to try and guess where this one's drawn from, you're welcome to do that. But I'm gonna read a quote, not from John Muir. I'm gonna read a quote from Josiah Whitney. Josiah Whitney was the geologist, the state geologist of California, about the time that John Muir came to Yosemite. And some of you probably already know that uh, Josiah Whitney saw Yosemite much differently than John Muir. Two major differences. One is that uh, Josiah Whitney, when he saw the high country of Yosemite, the, the crest of the Sierra, he said that all the glaciers were gone. Glaciers did carve it, but all those glaciers were gone. And Muir went up there and said, no, there's still glaciers there. And he was the one who kind of brought up the idea of living glaciers in the area. Most of those are gone now. Anyway, um, Whitney, on the other hand, saw the valley created a much different way than by glaciers. And Whitney wrote, the bottom of the valley sank down to an unknown depth owing to its support being withdrawn from underneath. Subsistence over extensive areas of the earth crust is not new at all in geology. There is nothing in this particular application that should excite surprise. So this is what, you know, th this is what Whitney thought. But Muir came along and looked at this and looked at the evidence and does his science thing and realizes that this is really about um, being carved with glaciers, that Yosemite is carved with a glacier. And I think this drawing does a pretty good job of showing how that may have happened. 
And this is probably from the top of North Dome. Well, actually, it's off of North Dome a little bit at a very dangerous spot. I have not yet been to it. Uh, I actually had a friend of mine take this photograph of North Dome when they visited a few years ago. I've been to North Dome a number of times, but not to do this project. I really want to get back because there's a couple more sites right in that very area that I'm excited about getting to. Okay, so let's keep talking about glaciers. Uh, this one uh, is of Half Dome, uh, quite, uh, quite clearly there. And this drawing actually got uh, fixed up and end up in one of Muir's articles about the glacial origins of Yosemite. And uh, this is close to where Muir was. This is a schematic drawing, which some of Muir's drawings are. So where he actually is could be in space, but I found that I could get to this really great spot and, and observe pretty much where Muir is uh, sitting for this. And you know, this drawing really, this, this is an amazing spot. It's not too far from the trail, a little bit of a scramble, but nothing, no technical rock climbing needed. And it is really secluded there. And it's just this amazing place where you're looking up Tanaya Canyon, you can see, um, uh, uh, you can see um, Clouds Rest to the right there. On the left is Mount Watkins. And so it's just this beautiful view looking down this street of domes where the glacier used to come straight down in that area. And these, when I get to these places, I'm like, thank you, John Muir. Thank you for showing me this really amazing place. Okay, so let's flip that around. We've already seen, we've already looked up Tanaya Canyon. Let's look down Tanaya Canyon. And this one is kind of an interesting drawing. It's probably earlier in his career. I'm not really sure. A lot of the dates, you know, Mir does amazing drawings, but he's not really good at identifying when, where, and that sort of thing. So I had to do a lot of research. Uh, this one's great. I call it the glacial eye view of Tanaya Canyon. And he has one of his most famous stories is called a geologist winter walk where he goes up this canyon and he says, I thought a fast, a storm and a difficult canyon were just the medicine I needed. This is also a pretty dangerous time in Muir's life. He went up here, he says, this canyon is accessible only to Mount Muir's. And he was scrambling around and finally he slipped. And for the first time on my, you know, for the first time, uh, for the first time I touched Sierra Rock with my feet, I had fallen and he tumbled a little bit and he finally regained his consciousness and he looked around and he wasn't sure how long he'd been out. And he looked over and he's like right on the edge of another precipice and he, he could have died there, which is another common theme, by the way. Mir almost dies a lot. But anyway, he stands up and he looks at his feet and he says, there, that is what you get by intercourse with stupid town stairs and dead pavement. And so I was now awake and felt confident that the last of the town fog had been shaken from both head and feet. Now this one, I went to Google VR. It's deep inside that inaccessible canyon that Mira was talking about. I hope to get to this site probably this summer. I'm gonna to try to get up there. I'm gonna to need to, I'll, I'll need someone to go with me up that one. I don't wanna do that one by myself and end up in the same place as Mira. But for the book, I decided to choose a place where you could see it kind of. This is from um, looking out from uh, the tra trail up to Cloud's Rest. And you can kind of get the more or less the same angle. So let's talk a little bit about that last part about Muir's life, preservation. And just a heads up, I've probably got uh, about a handful of slides left to go. Um, and, and just so you know, uh, preservation. Uh, this one here is uh, looking up at uh, Glacier Point. And uh, let's try to figure out where this one is from. But what's interesting is that you can see these logs in the foreground. You can see little fences. Cook's Meadow was fenced off for animals, uh, livestock. and Muir had actually worked in a sawmill briefly, which we'll talk about in a minute, but he claims he never cut down a tree while he was there. But the reason why I wanna show you this one is we're starting to see a little bit of a theme here. Looks like Muir made a lot of drawings from more or less the same place. Now they're not all in the exact same place. I think he moved around a little bit, but there's that north or uh, south or half dome one that we saw earlier. In the middle is the Glacier Point one I just showed you. And on the right is Sentinel Rock that he did. And all three of these drawings are in the book. Um, I thought this is actually a Google uh, Street View image from their, uh, from their little street car. Okay, this is a, this is, let's talk a little bit more about the, you know, Muir as a mill, as a miller working in a mill. And he writes, I sleep in a mill for the sake of hearing the murmuring hush of the water beneath me, 
and I have a small box-like home fastened beneath the gable of the mill. People call it a hang nest because it seems unsupported. Fortunately, the only people I, <laughs> try that again, because it seems so unsupported. Fortunately, the only people that I dislike are afraid to enter it. And he talks about how those little windows that you can see in it have glorious views all up and down the valley. He can see Half Dome and he can see, uh, he can see Yosemite Falls and he can see El Capitan. He just has this beautiful view from this place. Lucky for us, this one's actually marked already. There's actually a plaque right there on the trail at Lower Yosemite Falls, and you can actually stand exactly where that is. And that showed up in a letter of his to one of his friends talking about what life is like there. Okay, you're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, Mike, that's easy. You can find cliffs and stuff like that. Well, how about trees? And I was thinking, there's no way I'm going to find any of Muir's tree drawings. Yes, hundreds of tree drawings. Well, this one gave me a couple little clues. Uh, one, it says Samoset, and it says named by Emerson. And I know that John Muir met with Ralph Waldo Emerson in 1870, uh, I can't remember the year, but anyway, he met with Ralph Waldo Emerson in the 1870s, early 1870s, and they went to the upper grove of the Mariposa, uh, the upper Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias in Yosemite. And I'm like, okay, that looks like a little pile of trees there. I should be able to find this one. Fortunately, I found an old map that showed where some of the tree names are listed. And it's really interesting. The trees uh, have been renamed and renamed and renamed. So no map is really reliable, but I had a pretty good idea. I had a good map. And so I started walking around and I, I found it. I'm like, oh, there it is, right? You're probably looking at that going, oh yeah, Mike, you're absolutely right. That is Samoset. That's the tree that Emerson named, right? I mean, it's obvious. Okay, that's fine. If you're thinking to yourself, that is no way that that's what's going on there. Um, you can't quite, you can't see anything. But if you look really carefully at the tree Samoset, you'll see a little tiny, like a little burn mark in it right there at the bottom. And sure enough, there's Samoset. Unfortunately, the day that I was there, the sun was right behind it. So it was really hard to get a, a nice, clear, uh, lit up picture of it. But sure enough, there's that little mark all these years later of, of that very tree. And so I kind of figured out where Mira was standing. It's off the trail. So I actually, I give you the site on the trail, but uh, it's kind of off the trail there and you can look right at it and go, wow, this is it. <laughs> um, and Emerson had actually named this tree Samoset for the first Native Americans that um, that that uh, the Pilgrims met in 18 or 1620. Uh, interestingly enough, Muir did not like this practice of naming the trees. Uh, in fact, Muir didn't even like that because sometimes they'd actually put these um, tablets on them and Muir wrote, or worse, scarring them with black glaring names carved on marble tablets and countersunk in the brown bark, producing a shabby tombstone appearance which by the way, aligns with park values today. They no longer name trees in any of the parks. Uh, it's all legacy names only. And even some of those, they don't like to get out very often. Uh, this is a beautiful one here. You can probably see it's of Hetch Hetchy Valley. If you, anybody wants to guess where this one is drawn from, you may, I'm gonna read you a little passage from it. This valley is about three quarter mile wide, dry and ferny at the head with azaleas, alders and conifers along the river. In the middle, the densest grove of alder and young cedar that are so close to it, it's difficult getting through. Big Rock Creek is about twice the size of Yosemite Creek. It divides on this big delta into two main branches. I had a feast of raspberry on its banks where bears have been feasting before me. Very abundant. Vegetation as in Yosemite. And he is talking about Hetch Hetchy. And Hetch Hetchy is this beautiful valley in Yosemite that um, eventually ended up underwater and Muir fought tirelessly in the early 1900s to make sure that it would not become a dam. And Muir's real beef with it, it really wasn't about dams. It was putting a dam in a national park. What is the purpose of a national park? And this is something that they were struggling with between Muir's time and clear up and to today. We still don't know exactly how do we want to manage parks. One thing we have determined is we're never going to put another dam inside a national park. But there were a couple of, um, there are actually three dams as part of this project. And I believe two of them are in the park. This was the only one that Mira cared about. The fun thing about this one is I went there and visited it with some friends. And uh, when we got out there, 
uh, where we found this huge rock that Mir had to have been sitting on because even some of the rocks in the foreground kind of matched some of the rocks that you can see in the foreground of Mir's drawing as well. So we were very excited about that. So let's go to the other side of the Sierra. And this is a, another drawing. We are in the habit of calling all parts of God's world deserts. They're not fitted for our uses. Irishmen call deserts country, countries not adaptable to the growth of potatoes. So do the Hindu countries not fitted for rice. Nature makes no more ado about the so-called desolation of a country than any fraction of one. And now he's talking about Mona Lake. Mono is now an icy sea, now a salt hot lake, now desolate with fire, now with frost, now with sunshine, fertile lands made into deserts and death valleys simply because some mister died in them. So here we are, we're at Mona Lake. And this is a really remarkable drawing. If anybody wants to guess where we're making a drawing from, I can give you one little tip. Actually, I think I tell you in the next slide. So let me just put it up there. Oh, I didn't. So um, if you're on the Eastern Sierra and you're coming out of Yosemite, there's a gas station there. It's famously called the Wo Nelly Deli. And if you go up above the Wo Nelly Deli, there's a Vista Point there. And it's a remarkable Vista Point for a number of reasons. One is you're, on, you're standing on top of a glacier moraine, a bunch of dirt that got pushed down through Levining Creek area by a glacier. So you're sitting on top of that. But in addition to that, you're even on a glacier, I'm sorry, not a glacier, you're on a, a terrace of a historic lake, Lake Russell, that used to be where Mona Lake is today. It was even higher. It was up where I'm standing there in that picture. So we're on one of its terraces of a 22,000 year old lake and a 100,000 year old moraine. Now, obviously, uh, you probably are knowing the rest of this story that the city of Los Angeles starts to divert water from that was normally going to, into Mona Lake. They diverted it for their uses into Southern California. And so you kind of get an idea here that, oh, Calif or San Francisco is taking water from one side of Yosemite and LA is taking water from the other side of the Yosemite. So Yosemite is getting a lot of its water taken away from it. Um, but, you know, the city of Los Angeles agreed to bring some of the water levels of Mona Lake back up to its 1960s levels. And uh, interestingly enough, I'm holding up the drawing there. This is when I discovered that I was standing at that point. Uh, I was with a field trip of students uh, to the Eastern Sierra when I found this spot. Okay, I think we're just about our last one. This one's an interesting drawing uh, for a number of reasons. I have not yet been here. This is another one that I wanted to do last November. And uh, remember that big, uh, uh, the big atmospheric river that hit us in late October, I believe it was, uh, pretty much boxed me out of this trip, but I'll go again, I promise. But this is an interesting one. Um, you've probably heard quite a bit about uh, the story, the recent news, actually it's a couple of years old now, where the Sierra Club decided to re-examine its past, its history, and who were the, some of the founders of the Sierra Club and where do they fit in to the environmental movement. And in particular, there was some concerns about some of the language that Muir used against Native Americans in the Sierra, in California in particular. And what makes this one really interesting is this drawing is from the top of Bloody Basin. It's called Mono Pass as well. And we're looking out into uh, Mono Lake out there in the background. And you can see the Mono Cones off to the right there. And below us is Walker Lake. And it's right about in this area that Muir has this um, interaction with some of the native peoples in this area. And um, he doesn't use particularly flattering language to describe them. Muir is scared. And more importantly, um, you know, when we look at these Muir's writings and we need to understand them in the context of the time and the place. And also really important to think about is Muir, when he met these Native Americans here in 1869, uh, pretty much they were not you know, they, they had basically been, uh, you know, the settlers had chased them off, soldiers, gold miners, everybody had basically disappeared, uh, Native Americans from the California landscape, especially the Sierra Nevada. So if you ever want to kind of learn a little bit more, like I said, sometimes, you know, I go to these places to figure out the darker side of history as well. Uh, and this is not unusual either. This is the uh, Google uh, VR. I still don't know exactly where this one is. I'm not exactly in the right place here, but um, notice how Mir is drawing. The only way to make this work was I had to stretch it out. Okay. I think we're at the last of our 
of our uh, uh, getting towards the end of the presentation here. So uh, some of you probably already figured this one out, but I'm not going to tell you yet. Um, I'm going to show you that it's this. Uh, this is Taft Point. And uh, Taft Point is, a, uh, is, you know, obviously it was named for William Howard Taft, the president, uh, probably around 1908, I think it was named. I can't know for sure. And this one is way off trail and not a safe place at all. Um, I enjoyed it and it's, it was safe, but uh, I, you know, if you want to go, to, I can go there, but um, it's uh, pretty inaccessible right now for a number of reasons. But uh, yeah, this one was really exciting when I found this exact spot. And this one makes me think about, you've probably heard a lot about a few years ago, uh, Delaware North and the, the controversy of renaming things in Yosemite. And I found that whole discussion to be kind of humorous because you know, the walls of Yosemite, they're not changing their names. They're fine. You know, they may have names, but it doesn't matter. They're still going to be granted. Call them whatever you want. And a lot of places in Yosemite have changed names over the years. A lot of people got very excited when they renamed the Awani the Majestic, and they renamed Curry Village to Half Dome Village and other things. But even in Muir's lifetime, places like Half Dome also had the name South Dome and Tissiac. And the th my favorite is back to Half Dome Village again. That's named for the Curry family. The Curry family were business people that came into the valley to sell sites to live at. And so we named this site for them. Business people. It'd be like naming, you know, part of the valley, the, oh, the old Chevron station or something like that. So don't worry. The mountains are going to be fine. Doesn't matter whatever you call them. You can call them whatever you want, whatever makes you happy. But this is Taft Point. Uh, sometimes it's called uh, Profile Cliff. And this one was really exciting because when you zoom in, you can see on the left there, you can see that tree. Well, that tree is obviously gone. And what's left is the stump. Okay. Um, this is one of my favorite places to do what I like to call mirroring. And uh, why did I start doing this? Well, you know, this is in the middle. I'm there with my brother at uh, Taft Point. And uh, there's my friend, uh, Samantha, you know, doing something that probably is making you all a little bit sick. So if you want to just kind of cover up that part of the screen so you don't have to see it. But I've done this with students all over uh, the Grand Canyon, uh, Crater Lake, and that sort of thing. And that's mirroring the landscape. And Muir had this to say, because sometimes we get so used to what we're looking at all the time that we need to kind of look at it differently. And Muir writes, all that is necessary to make any landscape visible and therefore impressive is to regard it from a new point of view or from the old one with our head upside down. Then we will behold heaven and earth and are born again as if we'd gone on a pilgrimage to some far off holy land. So I recommend that you try it when you get a little bit uh, too used to something. And if you really want to understand and mirror the land and experience life as John Muir, we've created the Muir experience right here in the library at the University of Pacific. And uh, people can come visit it. And also in the lower corner there, you can see the website that Paul has shared. To, we've put all this, you know, so much of Mirror's life online. If you want to see the Mirror experience, just zip me an email and uh, I can set you up for that. It doesn't have regular hours yet. So for now, you just have to let me know and I will open it up and you can come look at it. Something else of interest that's coming up is the Mirror Symposium on April 23rd. You can grab that. Um, you can take a picture of the uh, symbol down there in the lower left if you want the uh, QR code for this event but we're going to be talking about some of the things that I talked about today and new perspectives on peoples and parks. And these people are gonna talk about, and we're gonna think about some of the things that Muir said about uh, different groups throughout his lifetime. So that's basically it. Uh, thank you all for showing up today. I also thank the Sierra Club. I thank the Yosemite Conservancy and especially my editor, Nicole Geiger. And I thank University of Pacific for uh, helping me with this financially. And of most importantly, I, I thank the family, the John Muir's family, their descendants for placing the John Muir uh, uh, material in to the, uh, into the University of Pacific. And thank you for sharing the Muir Symposium there in the chat. And I'm going to, oh wait, I was gonna show you one more slide. This is my make you jealous side. These are my offices. This is my office while I was working on that book. My office was all over. So I will take any questions. Uh, Paul, how do we do this? Can we just let them open up their mics now? Or how do you want to do this? Oh, hi. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Mike. Uh, <laughs> if you got any questions or comments, uh, feel free to type in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to 
uh, be unmuted, uh, let, us rate, let us know and I can unmute you so you can ask your question uh, through audio. And I just threw into the chat. Thank you, Stephen. I'm really looking forward to that trip. Um, I just put into the chat, if you want to learn more about the mere experience, you can visit that online. And of course, buying the book. Uh, you can probably just search for my name along with Yosemite and Muir and you'll find it just fine. But if you go to shop.yosemite.org and go to their book selection, you can find it there. And of course, you can find it through Amazon. And thank you, Keith and Laura, for showing up today. I know that was a long commute for you, going from Livermore to Livermore. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I finally I think I got all the websites that you wanted in there, Sam. And I think that's it. Yeah. Any questions about John Lear or Yosemite or. Um... I could make up some answers, too. <laughs> there's there's my there's my Paris friend saying thank you very much, Mike. What a wonderful trip. And, and uh, next time you visit, Natalie, we'll make sure to hit a couple of these places. Thank you, Karen. No questions. Just uh, all right. Ah, when did he last visit Yosemite? That's a good question. I think I looked it up once. I think the last time that he went to see the uh, trees was in 1912, only two years before his death. He was at that point 72, no, 74 years old. He died at 76 on Christmas in downtown Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a lot smaller at that time, but downtown Los Angeles. So yeah, he, he, uh, I, I'm kind of curious about that. Thank you, Keith. I'm going to, I want to look that up again because he, he did kind of have, he had to have had a last visit to Yosemite, but later in his life, he spent a lot of time in the desert and of course around his home in Martinez is also a place to visit. Oh, and my mom says, thanks too. <laughs> uh, when is, when's the best time to go to Yosemite, travel to Yosemite? Yeah, that's tricky. Somebody mentioned that or asked this question earlier. Let's see if they're still on. Looks like they may have taken off. So uh, Yosemite now. Oh, yeah, you're still there. Um, uh, my friend Tony asked about, um, you know, getting to Yosemite without the crowds. And that that is difficult. It's a little easier now because starting around uh, mid-May, they start the um, the uh, they start the reservation system. And it makes a big difference. It really does. Uh, it really keeps the numbers down. It's difficult to say whether or not that's equitable, but, you know, something that it really does help with the numbers. But really, I think, you know, for me, you know, if you want to see waterfalls, you got to go in the spring before the people show up. So April, you know, March, April and early May, that's a good time of year to see the water. If you're not so concerned about the water and you want to hike anywhere you want to go, go in October. That's really the key time. In fact, some of the people on this line have been to Yosemite with me in October and you can go anywhere because you don't have to worry about waterfalls or getting mud or snow or anything else like that. Um, so yeah, definitely spring and fall is the best time. And if you're going to go up for the day, go super early, you know, get in that car, leave Livermore at five o'clock in the morning because you want to get there before nine. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting in a line, even with the reservation system, you'll be sitting in a line for a couple hours and that's no fun. Looks like you got a question there from Gene. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, this recording will be available on the Livermore Public Library's YouTube channel. So uh, just uh, Google Livermore Public Library YouTube or go to YouTube.com and search for Livermore. And this, the record, this recording will be on our channel in a few days. Uh, and uh, again, the book is available to check out from the Livermore <laughs> Public Library and also hey. maybe from the Stockton Public Library yeah. or uh, libraries uh, everywhere. And Interlibrary it's nice, nice and compact. It's really yeah. made for traveling. If you, you know, uh, you take it with you as you explore the wonders of Yosemite. And it's also a good stocking stuffer <laughs> for holidays. Give it to uh, this, um uh, uh, nature lover that you know. <laughs> I've actually had more people compliment me about the cover and the design of the cover than the content. 
which is fine. And <laughs> anything to sell the book. So, but it is a really beautifully designed, they did a great job at the Yosemite Conservancy. And hopefully, you know, hopefully I can do a volume two. I'm hoping to someday to do a volume two. And, you know, Mira made drawings of Kings Canyon. He made drawings of Alaska. He made drawings all over the state. Ah. I think it'd be fun to kind of, you know, do, do a number. I could probably do up to five books this way. Love to anyway. Absolutely. Oh, there we go. Thank Somebody you, Aaron. Your... Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, make an appointment to visit uh, the special collections at uh, UOP. It's really, it's a great, uh, it, um, it's a great place. Um, I love UOP. Yeah, the book is great. Thanks, Keith. Um, do we, uh, well, it's, it's three o'clock. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Mike, for, uh, for doing this presentation. And thank you all for attending. Again, check out John Muir's Grand Yosemite. All right. Thank you, Welcome Natalie. Everybody. Thank you all for coming out today. And I just threw into the chat the digital stuff of Muir if you want to get in there and look at that. All right. So thank you, everyone. Take care and visit Yosemite. Yay. <laughs> Have a great day.